Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Beloit worship service on this fourth Sunday of July 2020. And as usual, the bulletin for the service will be emailed out to you after we've uh, filmed so you can follow along and take part in the uh, liturgy, which will be uh, uh, included in that emailing to you. We're going to uh, do uh, the Zoom teleconference uh, for the Coffee Fellowship, as usual, on, on this, uh, this coming Sunday, July 26th at 11 a.m. And you should have received an email about this uh, on Friday with the link and how to join. So I invite you once again to, to uh, join in on that Zoom call. Uh, there's probably 10 to 12 families that have been doing that consistently over the last few months. And we've been having a pretty good time. So I invite you to, uh, to try it out for the first time if you haven't already uh, been on that Zoom call. Finally, uh, in, in July and August, we're going to continue on with our worship and fellowship time um, at home. And we uh, have moved the, the tentative uh, opening date of our church to Sunday, September 13th. That's hopefully gonna give uh, uh, some time for the uh, pandemic to settle down uh, in the Beloit community and in Rock County. And so that's the date we're shooting for now is uh, Sunday, September 13th. So maybe put a star in your calendars and, and pray for that date that we can uh, meet here together once again in our sanctuary. At this time, I, I would like to uh, invite you to uh, join with me responsibly in our, in our call to worship. Listen to my prayer, Lord. Because of your faithfulness, hear my requests for mercy. Because of your righteousness, answer me. I remember the days long past. I meditate on all your deeds. I contemplate your handiwork. I stretch out my hands to you. My whole being is like dry dirt, thirsting for you. Tell me all about your faithful love come morning time, because I trust you. Show me the way I should go, because I offer my life up to you. Let's join together in the prayer of, uh, unit, of, uh, of, of invocation. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good and gracious, righteous and true. We look forward to the day that is coming when you will right all wrongs and bring everything under your holy authority. In the meanwhile, use us as you will in the forwarding of your plans and purposes and bring many to faith in you as the God of our salvation. And Lord, we, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we will continue to, uh, to pray as we have been doing for uh, several people in our church and for what's going on in, in our community and country and world. And uh, we've met, make, uh, been making some headway with uh, several of our people. Uh, we've been praying for, for Marilyn. Marilyn was uh, in the hospital this past week, but now she's, um, she's back home. And uh, uh, just continue to pray for, uh, for God's strength and encouragement uh, in, in her life as she uh, gets used to being home again with, uh, with some help from her family uh, being there. C continue to pray for, for Russ, who uh, is, is hanging in there uh, in the care facility that he is in and with the help of his family. Uh, lift him up, if you would. And uh, also pray for George. George uh, is, is making uh, continued progress in his recovery from a stroke and uh, is, uh, is in a care facility and uh, in rehab. And uh, I, I saw him uh, uh, about a week, a week ago and uh, had a good visit with him through the window and uh, continued to pray for George as well and, and others that you may know that, that needs God's uh, healing and mercy. And again, keep praying for, especially for our doctors and nurses who are being uh, overwhelmed once again, and especially in the hospitals that uh, they would be 
be able to endure and persevere and continue to pray for people in general that uh, we would all do what we can to, uh, to help lower the, uh, uh, the incidence of this pandemic by, by wearing a mask and by keeping our, our distance from others uh, uh, as, as necessary and by uh, washing our hands quite often. If we do those three things, we will help uh, one another to, uh, to lower this thing and get control over it sooner and continue to pray for, for God's help in this as well that uh, he would, would help us endure and put to rest this uh, pandemic once and for all. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this, uh, this moment in, in this service that we come before you and, and consider your love for us, how, how much you care and that you want to be in, involved in our lives and have a, a close relationship with us as your people and as your children. And we ask, Lord, that you would, would help us to, to come before you uh, both in, in awe and wonder as well as in confidence and uh, uh, looking forward to spending time with you in prayer uh, this, this day and in the days to come. Lord, help us not to be afraid of you as, as the God who is so great and awesome, a, a righteous God, a holy God, but help us to have uh, faith in you that uh, you indeed do love us and you want us to come before you you want to be close to us and you've allowed us to do this through your son jesus christ through his uh, death on a cross and by his resurrection from the grave you you've done this by sending your holy spirit to our world that uh, dwells within our hearts when we uh, in, invite you in and that helps us to to carry out uh, your purpose and plan for our, for our lives on this earth while we are here. Lord, give us confidence in, in, uh, in your day and in your way, and, and hear our prayers this day. We continue to pray, Lord, for uh, some of our, our, our members uh, of our church, for Marilyn and for Russ and for George, and for anybody else that we may have uh, uh, forgot about or is not being mentioned, uh, let us lift them up in prayer today as well for, for healing, for comfort, for encouragement. Lord, help these, uh, these folks and others to fight the good fights and to run the race as much as they can um, and, and give them hope and uh, trust that uh, you are there with them and be with their families who are seeking to uplift them as well, Lord, and with our church who wants to stand by them and be an encouragement to them. Lord, we, we continue to pray for our doctors and nurses especially who are our heroes, who are doing everything they can to, to keep people alive in, in hospitals everywhere and, and are, are being a, the, the main source of comfort since their families can't see them, uh, the, the patients that are there. Be with those people, those very, very special people, Lord. And help us, Father, as a, as a country, as, as individuals, to do what we can to... Uh, protect ourselves from uh, getting this, this virus into our, our bodies. Uh, help us, Lord, to take this responsibility and to, to choose to do what, what is right in your sight as, as well as for the benefit of others. Uh, encourage us, Lord, in, in doing this ourselves especially. Father, be with our church. Uh, we've been away from each other in this building for so many months. And we are, we are weary. We would love to come back here and be together on a Sunday morning and, and have all of our usual fellowship activities and do our service projects and, and to reach out and care for people. Uh, but we haven't been able to do that. Help us, Lord, to, to find ways and, and situations uh, away from this building uh, that we can minister in your name uh, to others that we encounter uh, to people in our family, men relationships, uh, draw us close to each other, Lord. Uh, help us to, to reach out to our neighbors and uh, be, be with us as we seek to serve Jesus Christ in our community especially. Lord, please uh, hear our prayers this day and, and give us confidence that you will indeed act in our life when we seek to draw close to you. And Lord, we, we also want to pray together the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples and which we are, are one in you when we pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has, has richly blessed our church uh, these past few months and uh, greatly appreciate all the uh, members and friends who have continued to, uh, to send in a, a, an offering. And uh, we, we give these offerings to the Lord this day to, to bless and to use and encourage uh, others to keep on doing this in the coming weeks ahead until we can be here again to put these offerings um, in a basket or in a plate. So let us come before the Lord and ask his blessing upon these gifts this day. Let us pray. Almighty and, and gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to give to you, to, to say thank you for how you have blessed us. And we also want to be a blessing to you and to others this day. And we ask you to receive uh, these monetary gifts that people have taken the time and made the effort to, to mail into the church and that the, these, uh, these gifts might be used uh, in, in great ways to minister uh, within the church and uh, outside of the church, Lord. Thank you for the, the, uh, the gift of, of giving to you and continue to bless us in doing this in the, in the days and weeks ahead. As we pray in Christ Jesus' name, amen. God's word for our lives today is from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment and has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feast I will remove from you. They are a burden and a reproach to you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this day. Truth be told, in my 42 years of preaching, I've never preached a message using the Old Testament minor prophet book of Zephaniah as the primary text. In fact, Rarely have I sermonized from any of the 12 minor prophet books from the Old Testament, save perhaps the book of Micah. And that's mainly because during the season of, of Advent at Christmas time, because of his messiatic uh, reference to where the birth of God's anointed one would take place. So I, I, I asked myself the question. What, what is it about the minor prophets, such as uh, Obadiah 
and Nahum and, and Amos and Joel and, and Malachi and the like that, that makes them so unattractive to me. And for that matter, having drawn many other ministers to preach from or cause people in general to read or do a Bible study on. What, what is it about the minor prophets that we, we tend to, to ignore them, even though there's, there's you know, 12, 12 books uh, of, of the Bible, uh, and, and they're there for a reason for us to, to read and apply to our lives. Well, for, for one thing, they're, they're from, the, uh, from the Old Testament. And I think there's a, a natural desire for us to, to focus uh, more upon the, the, the New Testament, uh, which, is, which is more, more recent uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in, in its timing and, in, and maybe more applicable in, in its message. You know, the, the first of the, of the minor prophet books were, were written in the middle uh, to late uh, 1700s uh, BC. And, and then f four of those books were written uh, in the late uh, 600 BC. And then the, the last four were written around 500 BC. These, these books are, 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 are really old. And they just don't maybe seem as, as relevant to, to our time today or as, a, as a applicable to our, to our lives uh, as maybe the, the message and uh, the writings of the New Testament uh, do. For another thing, uh, the 12 minor prophet books, they're, they're not nearly as long as the, as the five major prophet books of the Old Testament. Uh, the major prophets were, were Daniel and, and Ezekiel and the writings from Lamentations, and especially Isaiah and, and Jeremiah. And th this doesn't make the, the minor prophets any less important, uh, but their, their message is, is easier to, to miss or, or to skip over uh, because of their relative uh, shortness of, of each of the books. And, and then the other thing, especially about these uh, 12 books of the Bible, uh, including Zephaniah, is they're just mostly about doom and gloom, it seems, about judgment and, and wrath, which not only didn't make the minor prophets uh, or prophets in general uh, very popular with the people back then but perhaps makes them even less popular with with us people today but you know what in, in actuality there is good news in these 12 books of the Old Testament you just got to work a little harder and, and, and dig a little deeper to see it to to hear it uh, to uncover it and to and to discover it. So, why now? Why why do a a, a, a series on on the minor prophets, uh, starting with this message from uh, from Zephaniah today? Well, there there's a couple reasons for this. One is uh, uh, some Presbyterian pastors from the Milwaukee Presbytery. They, they each uh, have, have shared an a, a, a online message, both by uh, audio and video and by written manuscript, which other pastors are, are free to use or not use in any way or form that they want. And I, I've uh, read several other messages, and I, and I found them to be uh, interesting and, and relevant and, and challenging. Uh, especially addressing and dealing with uh, social and spiritual issues that we are experiencing in our country today. So I, I wanted to, to, to maybe try this out and uh, uh, add to and change and, and adjust, but there were some, some good thoughts to share, and uh, this has been something that's been shared with, with us to, to you. So I, I wanted to try this out, um, and this was an encouragement to me to dive in and to, to actually preach some messages uh, from the Minor Prophets. So we're going to start with uh, Zephaniah today. American uh, historian and playwright and thinker, his name is uh, Howard Zinn, uh, he, he once uh, very famously said this, 
History is like a, a moving train. You can't ride the train and then say that you have no idea how you arrived at your destination. You can't be neutral on a moving train. History is like a moving train. And I, and I have to, to agree that right off that uh, I can't think of a time in my life when I've been more aware of, of being on, on that train than right now. I mean, sure, we've, we've always known intellectually and that we're, that we're always moving and we, that we're always changing. And though we don't overtly notice it or, or feel it, the, the earth is constantly turning. As long as, as we're alive, that's what we're experiencing. We don't, we don't feel the earth moving under our feet, but, it, but it's moving. And uh, every cell in our body is, is constantly uh, regenerating. And, and over a period of time, we actually have a whole new body of, of, of cells. And so we're, we're moving and we're changing all the time as we live on this earth. And, and movement is inevitable, and, and so is change. But, but you know what? These days, things feel different. We are, we are living right now in historic times. It, it's, it's been a surprise. It's been a shock. But we are. We didn't see it coming, but we are living in, in times that, uh, in, in years ahead, uh, people will be talking about uh, during this time that we have lived. We're, we're in the midst of a, of a global pandemic that we just can't seem to kick as a nation or get control of. Uh, the, the healthcare system that we thought was so robust has turned out to be uh, uh, ill-prepared and, and so many people are, are, are getting sick today that uh, uh, hospitals and doctors and nurses uh, can hardly t take care of them. Uh, the, the safety nets that we thought would, would be there to catch us are ready to burst. And it seems that certain communities within our nation uh, are being disproportionately impacted by this disease. There's, there's hot zones uh, everywhere that are cropping up. And then you add to this uh, uh, to, to this pandemic, uh, civil unrest, uh, primed with our disillusionment and, and fueled by moral outrage. And, and for the, the first time in, in my life, and, and, I, and I agree uh, with, with Nikki, the pastor, who, who uh, put together uh, this, this message on Zephaniah, that it, it feels like our, our train is, is, is moving fast and really noticing what's going on in, in my own life and in the life of our earth. Um, and, and none of us really have an idea of, of how we're going to come out on the other side of all this. Um, if you wanted to, you could, you could even make a case that uh, we're, we're, we're finally there. The, uh, the, uh, the day of the Lord is upon us that, that we read about actually in the book of, of Zephaniah. He mentions the day of the Lord. And Jesus talks about the, the day of the Lord coming uh, sometime in the future. We don't know when it's going to be, but uh, God promises that it's going to be here. And uh, that, that day of the Lord, on the one hand, is a day of, of, of doom and of, of gloom. It's a day that God is going to uh, call us each to accountability in how we've lived our lives. And many people are, are afraid of that day. Uh, they're, they're terrified to, uh, to experience it, whether they're still living on this earth at the time or whether they've been long dead. Uh, it's, it's not something that they want to think about. It's not something that I, that I really necessarily want to think about. I, I want to live for as long as I can live on this earth. I want my, my, uh, my children and my, my grandchild to, to live and, and have a, a, a good life while they can on this earth. And like I said, it would be easy to to make a case that we're, that we're here, that the day of the Lord is upon us. And you know, I, I might be maybe even more convinced if, if today or tomorrow uh, the, the San Andreas Fault in California fi finally went 
and uh, uh, half of California fell into the ocean, which would include my, my two brothers right now with everybody else. If, if that were to happen right now, that might convince me more that we, that we are uh, experiencing going through that right now. Uh, but I don't truly believe that myself, and uh, especially the fact that uh, Major League Baseball uh, started this week. And uh, I, can, I can watch uh, my, uh, my beloved Dodgers beat the Giants and, and, uh, as they have the last two nights. And I can check the box scores. And uh, so that, that tells me that the day of the Lord is it's still off there someplace into the future. And that makes me feel good. We have to still wonder, however, how bad things are right now and how bad they're going to be getting. Um, how bad is our economic devastation going to be? Um, how many people are going to be affected by what's happening in our lives? It, it, it still feels really, really heavy during this time that we're living. And, and we have to wonder who will step up to help. Well, what will be worse? What will be better? I, I, I agree with, with Howard Zen that history is like a, a moving train. Um, God's plan is, is, is like a moving train. God has a plan and a purpose for our life. And we have to pay attention to which direction that we are heading, which direction and what we're doing um, while we're on that train, while we're living our life here on this earth. Because if there's one thing we know for sure, it's this, that we are not standing still. And we can't be neutral. We can't be neutral on this moving train. Perhaps Zephaniah felt much the same way throughout most of his ministry. You see, Zephaniah, he, he wrote at a time when, when King uh, Josiah had been ruling over Israel. And, and Zephaniah, he was the, uh, the great-great-grandson of, of, of a great king of, of Israel, uh, Hezekiah. And uh, he uh, lived in, uh, in, in, in Judah from, uh, uh, well, he, Hezekiah was the king of Judah from 715 to 686 BC. And then there was a, another king that came to the throne that was not a good king, that had disobeyed God and then Josiah took the throne, and uh, he was indeed a, a good king and was uh, trying to make a, a lot of uh, uh, good changes for, uh, for Judah during that time when there were, were a lot of uh, foreign gods that were being worshipped in Jerusalem. And the main thing that Josiah did during his reign was to attempt to, to make these big sweeping reforms by restoring the temple and removing these, these foreign gods. But as he went about this, he discovered that worshiping these other gods was just so entrenched in the lives of the people of Judah. And, and making a change uh, was, was just too hard for them. And so the, the people they, that uh, even uh, with, with Josiah making these reforms and Zephaniah uh, preaching uh, this, this message from God, the, the people, they, they either remained the same or, or they remained in place. And, and at best, they were just kind of stuck in neutral. They, they either didn't change their behavior or they changed their behavior for, for a little while, but they didn't really mean it. Their hearts weren't really in it. And, and they stagnated rather than doing the hard work of, of change. And so their society uh, de deteriorated around them. And Josiah's reforms were ultimately unsuccessful. And as for, uh, for him, he, he eventually dies on the battlefield. And uh, this uh, set his country on, on a, co a collision course with, with Babylon. And, and much of what uh, Josiah, in fact, uh, or much of what uh, Zephaniah had been prophesizing, in fact, all of it came to fruition. 
King Josiah's failed reforms and his foreign policy uh, that, that didn't take effect, it set the stage for, for Babylon to invade Jerusalem and destroy the temple and take the people into exile. And Zephaniah, well, he'd seen it coming for years. He had been warning the leaders of Jerusalem the whole time. And, and the book that bears Zephaniah's name, it's, it's a collection of these warnings, or at least the, the first two chapters and, and part of the third chapter are. And in fact, all, all, of the, all of the prophets, both the major ones and the minor ones, mo most of their writings were, were, were warnings, were, were exhortations to the people to, uh, to open up their eyes, to, uh, to change their lives, to do what was uh, righteous in God's sight, to, to obey his commandments. And today uh, we, we are reading about Zephaniah's uh, uh, warning to the people of, of Jerusalem in the, in the first couple chapters. He, he, ta he talks to them about uh, not continuing to worship these foreign gods. He, he tells them not to, to write off God as if God is, is powerless or he doesn't care. You know, God, God is a God that we have to take at his word. We, we have to take God seriously because God is the God of our earth. God is the God of the moving train. God is the God who has a purpose and who has a, the, the ultimate plan for each of our lives while we are here on this earth. And it makes me wonder if Josiah's reforms perhaps had gone a, a, a couple steps farther, maybe they would have, have, uh, have stuck. Um, God wasn't calling for a mere change in the worship practices within the temple, but he also was, was calling for changes in, 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 in their faith and, and in, in public policy, in, in flesh and in blood relationships, and in the way that we, that we love our neighbor. God was calling for, for a change uh, and a restoration of uh, being faithful to him, uh, to, to doing what was righteous and holy in, in his sight, as, as he had told the people uh, all those years, through, beginning with Moses and through every prophet that came before them. After all, in this chapter, uh, Zephaniah is describing uh, all the institutions for worshiping other gods and all the leaders who have perpetrated injustice and all the economic centers where crooked borrowing and and lending took place. And, and all of that was going to be gone along with the city's walls. And it had to do with people's relationship with God himself, with not carrying out his plan for their lives, with not doing what was right and, and holy in his sight. And as part of this, today we find God's lighting a lamp to search out and, and to root out a particular type of of evil within uh, within our own uh, city and country and and and, and world, uh, it's it's the same thing that God is calling us uh, to accountability today. As Zephaniah called these people to accountability, it's it's not the, the thieves or uh, or the merchants who rip people off in the marketplace. Uh, it isn't the people who are who are worshiping other gods or corrupt priests who are leading. Um, people down the wrong paths. It's, it's much more insidious than that. God looks for the one who pretends not to see that person passed out in the cold on a, on a park bench and, and utters to themselves, I hope they're okay. God, God is, is looking for us as well today to change in, in how we relate to him and especially in how we are relating to our neighbors. It's, it's, it's the people who are, are saying, it's, it's, uh, who, who believe this themselves, it's pretty clear that God's not going to do anything about this, so why should we? That's what many of the people back in Zephaniah's day were saying, that they weren't taking God seriously. So why should they take him seriously? Zephaniah's message back then, uh, his, his, his warnings and his exhortations uh, are still applicable to us today. 
So we, we have to take God seriously. We have to take God at his word. God looks for people who know that they should be taking care of others, who, who know that they should have a, 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 a righteous relationship with him. Even though we're not perfect, even though we've all sinned in God's sight, God gives us the ability to be righteous in his sight through Jesus Christ. And he, he knows, uh, he wants us to, to have this kind of relationship with him. And he especially wants us to love others in his name and his way. That we should be taking care of the widows and the orphans and, and the foreigners in, in our lands as their law uh, uh, commanded over and over again. But think that, that nobody uh, that cares will, will uh, do anything about this. And it's just, it's just so tempting for, for each one of us to say, you know, one of these days I'll, I'll, I'll get my act together and, and, and do it. But so many times that day never comes. The ones who say, someday I'll just, I'll stop cutting checks to the soup kitchen and go down there and, and get my hands dirty. Someday I'll stop working so much and spend more time with my family. But that someday never comes because at the end of the day, they and we are comfortable with the way things are. In short, God is seeking out those who are complacent and who are indifferent. Zephaniah seems to understand that time stops for no one. That there is no time to sit around and wish for the past or to or to try to make things stay as they are or to navel gaze and wonder why nobody visits our churches anymore there is no time for us to turn a blind eye to our relationship with God or to human suffering or to offend as few people as possible there is no time to remain neutral because like it or not we're on a moving train and God does not allow us to stay in neutral or to sin willfully in his sight and what God seems to want to communicate through this is that more than anything else is that God is not indifferent God is not complacent. God is actively working today to ensure that there will be an ongoing relationship between him and his people. God is not indifferent, and neither are we as God's people. And we're not called to be indifferent or complacent about our relationship with God, about public policies, about the well-being of all or about anything else that God cares about. So if we can't be neutral, how do we know what to do? There are so many voices talking at us in our society today, partisan voices, opposing voices, deeply entrenched voices. And they're all saying that we should be doing so many different things. How can we weed through it all? And get down to the brass tacks. How are we supposed to know what God wants? I believe that it is helpful here to make our way back to our roots, to an ancient Christian tradition asserted by St. Augustine of Hippo. It's known as the, the law of love and, and described by Augustine like this. Whoever thinks that he understands the Holy Scriptures or any part of them, but puts such an interpretation on them that does not tend to build up the twofold love of God and our neighbor, does not yet understand them as he ought. And this sounds a whole lot like what Jesus taught, saying that all the laws of the Old Testament all of the of the laws and the writings of all the prophets all of it all of it it hangs on love it hangs on love 
on the twofold love of God and neighbor. And everything else is supposed to take a back seat. What Jesus and Augustine seem to be asserting, Augustine got it. Augustine got the message of Jesus quite clearly. They're asserting that there may be times when we misunderstand God, and there will be certainly be times when we make errors. But I will tell you if I'm going to make an error, I pray to err on the side of God's love every time. Why? Because God is not doctrine. God is not denomination. God is not war or law. God is not hate or hell. God is not complacency or willful ignorance of the condition of humanity or uh, God does not give us the total freedom to go uh, sin in his sight and do whatever we want to do. God is love, active, restorative, healing love. It seems that Zephaniah's call out of complacency is indeed a call for us to love. It's very clearly shown in, in his third chapter. This is what God is, is really wanting us to do. He doesn't want to be wrathful to us. He wants to be loving to us. So ask yourself this. Does my doctrine foster within me a greater sense of love and community with my neighbors? If not, it may be time to reevaluate. Do the words I speak about God foster love in the hearts of people who hear them? Do my prayers push me to act in love on the behalf of others? Have I followed Jesus' example to put others before myself? Does my allocation of resources and time reflect that? Do I take the time to really see the suffering that goes on in this world? Does my love for God fill my entire being, control my entire life, fill my soul to the point that it overflows into each person I meet? In our congregations, we may ask if our traditions serve as beacons of God's love here and now, or if we're merely haunted by the ghosts of traditions past. We might wonder if our churches have continued to be rooted in our ever-changing neighborhoods, or if our buildings are indeed more of a burden than they are a boon. If we cannot answer yes to these questions, we might just need to consider what the heck we're doing here at all. Because all this boils down to the fact that Jesus, the Church of Jesus Christ and all of its members should let nothing stand in the way of loving God and loving our neighbor. Frankly, friends, our train has left the station and history is being made right now. And if we want any input about our destination, now is the time for love to be acted upon. You know, God is a, is a God both of, of tough love and, and tender love. And, it, and it's true, the, uh, the, the beginning chapters of each of the 12 minor prophets, it, it tells of, of God's wrath, but it also tells of, of his righteousness. It, it talks of, uh, they, they talk of his, of his holiness. God is a, 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 a God who loves us with tough, tough love. He calls us to accountability because he loves us. He cares for us. He, he wants us to, to be his people. He doesn't want us to be afraid of him or, or fearful of him in a, in, a, in a way that causes us to, to run the other way because of his, of his wrath. But he wants us to, to, to truly do what he wants us to do. He, he's serious about his word. God is a, is a God who, who loves us in a tough way, but God is also a, love, a God who loves us in a very, very tender way. And, and that's really the, uh, the, the message that each of the, of, the, of the minor prophets want to give to us, uh, as well as that Zephaniah and his word. And this third chapter especially, 
it just oozes uh, the, the, the tender love of God for us. God is, is even willing and, and able and wants to sing for us, he, Zephaniah says. He loves us that much in such a, a tender way. And that's, and that's really the, the message that I wanted Zephaniah, that he loves us both toughly, but he also loves us tenderly. Stuart Briscoe, one of my favorite preachers as well as authors, he, he shared, a, shared a story in his book on the Minor Prophets called Taking God Seriously. And in the chapter he wrote on Zephaniah, uh, which is an excellent example of how to, how to balance this, this tough and tender aspects of God's love, he, he tells a story about an 11-year-old golfer. This 11-year-old golfer who was a, a tall, blonde kid and who was big for his age. And he was developing so quickly that he was able to compete with, with 15-year-old kids and, and beat them most of the time. And this young fellow, he could hit the ball a mile, uh, or so they said. He had a superb swing and, a, and style, and, and he had the poise most of the time as an adult. And, and one day, so the story goes, he, he made a bad shot, and this, this, this young lad, he, he angrily threw his club as far as he could. And his father, who was playing with him at that time, he walked over and he picked up the club and he brought it back and he handed it to the boy, saying, here is your club. The next time you do that will be the last time you ever set foot on this or any golf course. And the boy, whose, nick, whose name was Jack, he took his father's words to heart. And those who are interested in golf are probably glad that Jack's father didn't just say, naughty, naughty, you mustn't do that, or say to him, next time you do that, you can retrieve your own club. His father didn't just look the other way and pretend that it didn't happen or make excuses for his son. And we can be glad that he didn't bend the club over Jack's head or kick him off the golf course right there and then. But there was a, a toughness about that father's love, but there was a tenderness also because Mr. Nicholson knew his boy Jack was only 11 years old. And that's the way that, that God loves us. He, he loves us in a way that is tough, but he loves us in a way that is tender. The, the book of Zephaniah and, and all the minor prophets, th these are books about God's salvation, as, as well as books about wanting, uh, he, him wanting us to live out our life in a way that is, that is uh, caring for other people and, and loving our neighbor. It's, it's both. It's, a, it's about a God who is our judge, uh, and it's also about a God who is our Savior. And, and who would you rather meet? A God of, of righteous indignation? Or a God who, who loves us like a, like a mother or like a father would, who receives us warmly, who holds us securely, who, who, who quiets us with his love, as Zephaniah talks about, who rejoices over us with singing. I want us to come before this God as a God of love, a God of, of tough love, but a God of, of tender love that we not fear the day of the Lord when it does come, that we can come to God with, with uh, confidence that, that our faith in him, our, our, our hope in him, his love for us uh, will, will carry the day that day, and that he will indeed smile upon us and sing to us that day that is not a day of, of doom and gloom, but it is a day that we can look forward to in our future. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you, you love us in such a way that calls us into accountability, that you don't let us uh, do whatever we want to while we live our, our lives on this earth, but you want us to be a, a people of, of responsibility, a people of, of action, a people who are taking seriously uh, your commandments and are wanting to be righteous in your sight 
And we, we want to invite you to, to love us uh, toughly, Lord, to love us in ways that, that help us, that, that discipline us, that uh, keep us in our, in our place that where, where we should be and keep us away from where we shouldn't be. And yet, Lord, we thank you so much that you love us in a, in a tender way, that you died uh, and you sent your, your son to die on a cross for us, for each of us, that we might be saved through, through him. And, and that's the kind of love that we know that you have for us, a, a love that puts your wrath upon Christ's shoulders, and, and he took that wrath upon the cross and, and bore that for us. And that shows, Lord, how much you, you do and love us indeed. Lord, may we read the, the whole book of, of Zephaniah this coming week, each word, Lord, and, and consider what you are saying to us through uh, his prophecy so many years ago, and that we can apply that to our lives today and, and to, to, to move us, Lord, to, to do something, to not just stay in neutral on this moving train, but to love you and to love others as we pray in your name, and as we pray that the, the Lord's blessing would go upon us and be uh, shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, we seek that from you this day. Amen.